progress. Uh, um, Okay, and so uh, you'll see that there are still a couple of things that we're trying to figure out uh, how to do better or improve. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, yeah, if you have any suggestions or, or ideas. And also this is the first time I'm presenting it. So I'm a little um, um, also worried that uh, some things will not go as, as well as I would like to, but, uh, but let's see. Um, so I am uh, supposed to talk for about 45 minutes, right? Um, if I, rem yeah, so, um, please remind me uh, if I have like 10 minutes left, uh, if I'm, oh, I will. Yeah. if you see I'm going too slow because uh, I usually run out of time, but uh, this is not a long presentation, so uh, so hopefully but, that, that won't happen. Well, I think we are also flexible, but I will let you know. Anyway. Okay, all right, very good. And again, please interrupt me at any point uh, if any questions, uh, clarifications, uh, comments, etc. Okay, so this uh, paper uh, talks about household demand and willingness to pay for uh, grid electricity. And uh, we're using data from Burkina Faso. It's a joint work with uh, Joshua Deutschmann and Leopold Sarr. So Joshua is a, well, he was a PhD student when he started, now he graduated and he's in Chicago. And uh, Leopold is a the small consulting firm at, uh, um, in Virginia, in the US, and uh, he pretty much uh, initiated the project. So they were working with the Millennial Challenge Corporation on uh, data collection, um, on a project to pretty much estimate willingness to pay for reliable electricity, uh, first in Senegal and then in Burkina Faso. And uh, that's how we got uh, involved in this, um, in this work. Um, so, so this paper is sort of as a, at the intersection of the other two papers that I have in, uh, in this line of research on electrification in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the first one talks about uh, demand side barriers uh, to access. Uh, so pretty much, uh, you know, this literature focuses on, uh, on supply side issues, right? And uh, how we should extend the grid in order to, uh, to achieve universal electrification. Uh, but the demand side uh, um, barriers were greatly neglected until very recently, right? And, and uh, the fact remains that even in areas that are covered by the grid, uptake uh, of grid electricity uh, remains relatively low. So in this uh, in this first paper, we tried to uh, to look at these demand side barriers and and try to see if we can uh, we can estimate the determinants of that uh, of the demand side uh, barriers in a in a consistent way. And then the second paper, um, the, the paper using data from Senegal, and uh, there we tried to estimate uh, willingness to pay for reliable electricity in in Senegal. So here we're going to do both in a way. Um, and uh, sort of the, the the greater literature to which we we aim to contribute is the literature on you know how to um, how to plan uh, electricity expansion or grid electricity expansion in order to ensure sectors uh, financial viability. Okay, so these uh, these infrastructure planning decisions regarding electricity uh, rollout are very often aided by some tools which are designed to either predict demand or uptake in off grid areas or predict consumption of the newly electrified household, or predict how much households are willing to pay for both the connection itself and then in monthly payments. Okay, and there's a lot of uh, uh, papers uh, in sort of uh, every one of those, uh, those points. Uh, we're going to try to contribute to one and three. We're not going to talk about consumption. Um, maybe in the future, we will be able to say something about it because we do have data on that, but uh, for now, we focus on uh, uh, on demand, so how to estimate demand uh, from from survey data to then predict the uh, the demand in off grid areas. Pretty much, that's going to be the goal of the first part, and then the second part we're going to be trying to um, estimate the willingness to pay uh, for both the connection uh, and uh, then in monthly payments for grid electricity. All right, so there will be uh, a, a, quite a few things going on here, and I hope that uh, that I can, uh, yeah, sort of uh, keep my story straight of why are we doing all these things. So we'll start with uh, uh, with estimating the demand in areas under the grid, and uh, the the goal of this part is to estimate the demand consistently, so to account for non-randomness of electricity rollout process. Right, so usually. Um, methods that are used to, uh, to estimate demand or, or predict consumption if in off-grid areas rely uh, on some sort of matching techniques. And the problem with that is that they, of course, can account for all the observable characteristics, right, that determine the, 
uh, the uptake but or consumption levels but they failed to account for the fact that uh, that rollout of electricity is uh, is a non-random process so that's what we're gonna try to to do in the first part and i mean simply we'll just estimate Uh, well, we're going to use the model to predict uh, the uptake in off-grid areas. Okay, so again, accounting for the selection, uh, we're going to try to um, to use the model estimates to predict connection in areas currently not covered by the grid in Burkina Faso, and then we're going to compare the model predictions with the stated desire to connect among unconnected households. Okay, so uh, in the survey data that we have. Uh, people in households in off-grid areas were asked a couple of questions about the desire to connect and the willingness to uh, to pay for connection and then uh, for, for monthly bills. So we're gonna try to compare our uh, predictions from the model with these um, stated desire to connect or uh, pay monthly. And then we're gonna find something interesting there because uh, we're gonna see that there's a striking difference between the two. Okay, so what our model will predict will be very different to what people are actually stating in these off-grid areas regarding the desire to connect. But when we will look at the uh, questions that uh, sort of um, put the, it in a more concrete um, framework, so they ask people if they're willing to pay a certain amount of money, then our model predictions will become much closer to the uh, to the to the stated uh, preferences. Okay, so that's going to be the uh, the first uh, part, and then uh, what sort of comes uh, evident from this part that maybe um, these unconnected households in under the grid areas are behaving very different than the unconnected households in the off-grid areas because they do have some information about uh, the quality of service and the reliability of service. So they have much lower levels of uh, both willingness to pay and uh, desire to connect to, to the grid electricity than households in off-grid areas. Okay, so we're gonna then try to estimate the determinants of demand for grid electricity and um, also, the, uh, we're going to estimate the willingness to pay among unconnected households, okay, and see whether the uh, access, so whether uh, being an area that is under the grid is an important predictor of, of different aspects of demand, okay, to see whether this conjecture from the first part uh, uh, checks in the data or not. And then the very end, we're going to go back to our connected households and we're going to estimate the willingness to pay for electricity access, for, sorry, for, for reliable electricity access among connected households. And then we're going to compare it to the uh, willingness to pay for electricity access uh, among unconnected households. And the conclusion from this part is going to be that, uh, that uh, currently connected households are willing to pay more for improvement in service then uh, the currently unconnected households are willing to pay for connection in general. Okay, so the message that uh, that is coming out of this is that uh, maybe it makes more sense to uh, improve the quality of the current connections first and then think about grid extensions because that might bring more revenues than just extending the grid to, uh, uh, to areas that are not covered by the grid currently. Okay. Um, I cannot move the screen for some reason. I don't know. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So uh, the data that we're using is a recent survey data from Burkina Faso. The data collection was uh, in 2019. So this is still pre-COVID data. Um, and we have detailed information on about 2,200 households and 4,200 individuals residing in two regions of Burkina Faso. Okay, so this is not a national representative survey. The data was only collected in these two regions, which is uh, unfortunately a limitation of this uh, of this um, of this data, and therefore our our study as well. Uh, the cool thing was that in each household, two respondents were sampled. Okay, so this uh, this gives us um, an opportunity to to first test the uh, the results coming from other empirical studies, showing that there is a huge gender heterogeneity with respect to. Um, to these demand attributes of so both willingness to connect uh, and the willingness to pay for connection and then monthly for electricity between uh, so the heterogeneity again is between men and women and here in each household uh, these two respondents had to be uh, men and uh, women 
right? So we're going to be able to test that, and we're also going to be able to exploit this using a panel-like uh, model. Okay, so now for each household, we have two observations: one from the female, one from the male member of the household. So we're going to uh, we're going to use it to estimate uh, um, a panel uh, regression, which is going to help us to account for uh, for certain unobserved household level characteristics that could uh, lead to inconsistent estimates in a um, in a cross-sectional analysis, right? So, in 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 other words, we sort of use it as a robustness check of our of our results, right? And and in the data that we have, seventy eight percent of the surveyed households are in areas under the grid, and out of uh, these households, seventy seven percent are connected to the grid, which is provided by either Sonable or uh, or COP, which are the two main providers of of grid electricity in in uh, Burkina Faso. All right, so we're going to start again with estimation of the demand for grid electricity in under the grid areas. Okay, and we're going to do it to be able to then predict the demand uh, in uh, of grid areas. Right, so we're going to start by looking at uh, at uh, summer statistics. Uh, so we're going to compare the uh, not connected uh, households in under the grid areas to the connected households in, of course, under the grid areas. Okay, and, and just a quick look at this table shows that uh, these households are quite different. And the connected households, uh, not surprisingly, of course, appear to be better off economically. And also, as you, uh, sort of can be seen in the bottom panel here, that they seem to be um, in areas with, uh, with on average better uh, quality of service. Okay, so this is already a sort of a first hint that maybe this quality of service might be an important uh, determinant of, uh, of uptake uh, uh, in under the, the grid areas. All right. So uh, the way we're gonna uh, we're gonna sorry. tackle the the first question. Sorry, is this, sorry I'm not sure. Yeah. Is, is there room for questions now or like? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry, if you can just go back to the screen. I just want to find time. Sorry. Yeah. Um, if you can go back, yeah. Under the table with owner owns a home. Yeah. Uh, um, the difference between they're connected to the grid and not connected, the the proportion or the or the percentage. Is 0 0.715 and 0 0.672. Does that mean that um, the households that are not connected to the grid has a higher proportion that own a home? Yeah. Compared to those that are connected to the grid, that's that's weird for me. But yeah, I I, I agree. Some like that. Yeah. I, I think that uh, that's uh, uh, because the, the not connected households are more likely to be in rural areas and. Uh, um, uh, these uh, homes in rural areas more, are more likely to be owned by the uh, by the respondents than in than in urban areas. Uh, that's that, like still got a bond to pay or something. Yeah. In the in the okay. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. the right. that's the that's the only um, yeah uh, sort of decent explanation I can give. And uh, um, to be fair, I was also surprised by that. I was uh, uh, thinking that uh, cool. it should be the cool. other way around. But yeah. 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 I, I have you. also a question. Mm -hmm. So, like, there's something like average blackouts. Uh, how is it measured? Uh, do you have measure external measure of blackouts? No, it's, uh, it's all self-reported. So, right. so a respondent were just asked to okay. to say, on average, in the last month, how many days were you without electricity? So, if if someone was not connected to the grid, then how he could know about blackouts? No, this is the average blackout in the in the uh, in the area. So this is uh, uh, so the, all these okay. households are in the areas covered by the grid, and okay. this is just the average of all the households uh, in the enumeration area around uh, a particular household that's, right. that's not connected yeah. to the grid or connected to the grid. Okay, okay. yeah. But, so, so, so in other words, there, there could be households that are in a, in proximity to households that are all connected. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Exactly. Okay. So, so again, this is uh, in this part we're looking only at the households that are under the grid areas. Uh, so, in principle, they could be connected to electricity, uh, but of course, some of those households uh, still opt out uh, from electricity connection. Okay. Now, I should be careful because uh, you know we don't know for sure whether they're not connected because they don't want to connect, or they're not connected because they're just too far from the uh, from the electricity pole. We cannot. Uh, 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 we don't know that. However, we can control for the distance to the nearest electricity pole in the regression. We have that information. Uh, so we'll do that, but it's uh, it's it's very likely the case that you know some of these households that are in under the grid areas are not connected, are still not connected due to supply reasons, not demand reasons. Okay. 
All right, so uh, so the model. So we're going to estimate a very simple uh, uh, binary um, a model uh, with sample selection to account for non-randomness of, uh, of electricity rollout. Okay, so we have the, the main equation, uh, which is uh, whether a household is connected or not, right? So this connected uh, variable is a binary variable. It takes on value one if household J is connected to the grid and zero otherwise. And then, uh, of course, we can only observe connections for uh, house calls that are in areas under the grid, right? Or it, in essence, it, it only makes sense to look at, uh, at the choice of, of, uh, of connection for house calls that are in the areas that are covered by the grid. So we can only observe it for house calls for which access variable is equal to one. And access is a binary variable that takes on value one if household J is located in under the grid area. Um, and then uh, this, uh, we have a, a vector of, of household, individual, and regional characteristics X. And it, here we're also going to include uh, elevation, uh, land elevation to proxy the cost of connection. And then in the, in the selection equation, uh, we're going to have the same variables and in X, uh, plus uh, something that we propose as a, as a, um, yeah, as a exclusion restriction, right, to achieve identification. Uh, and we're going to use the mean distance between the household and electricity poles in the enumeration area as an exclusion restriction. So this is all conditional on the distance uh, of a particular household from the nearest electricity pole. Okay, so here we uh, the, the instrument uh, or the exclusion restriction is the mean distance between the households and electricity poles in the enumeration area. Uh, so ob obviously we could identify it um, Without uh, uh, without this exclusion restriction, right? Theoretically, that works, but in 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 practice, it doesn't work very well. So uh, we're gonna propose that. Now I'll show you in a second the result. You'll see that uh, we could do better um, at uh, uh, at finding an exclusion restriction. So if you have any um, any ideas, uh, I would be very happy to hear those. Um, but for from for now, this is the best that we can do. Uh, yeah, with the data that we have. So here are the results. And I'm not so much interested in the in, in all these coefficients. Uh, uh, there, there are two things that are kind of surprising. Um, um, and I have not yet quite figured out why uh, these uh, these coefficients are as they are. But a couple of things I want to point out is here at the bottom, we have this log, uh, likelihood ratio test right, with a p-value of 0 0.05. So uh, this pretty much tells us that there is very uh, that there is some evidence that um, uh, that the selection and, and outcome equations are uh, correlated, but it's not very strong. So that tells me that uh, we should find another exclusion restrictions to to improve our identification of the model. But uh, um, as I said, we have not been able to do it uh, so far. Um, the 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 um, confusing signs uh, are is the sign on elevation, right? It's positive in the main equation. Uh, I would expect it to be negative, right? I would expect that um, that uh, um, the, the the sort of the the, the bigger value of the elevation variable, so the bigger uh, the elevation variable, the um, value, uh, the less likely the household is to be connected, right? Because it should be a higher cost, but that's not what we see. Um, and then the, another one is the difference, the distance from the nearest post. Uh, being less than one kilometer away. Again, I would assume that households that are closer to the nearest post will be more likely to be connected and, and this sign is negative. So I do not have any um, uh, good reasons to um, to explain that. We check different model specifications and these signs are pretty consistent. So, um, uh, so we're not exactly sure what's going on. It might be that uh, um, there's some, uh, some endogeneity that we're not accounting for in this model. Uh, and that's what's causing the, the signs to be um, not of what we would like them to be. I have, um, I have a so, question. Yeah. So, so the information about distance is not reported in survey, it comes from somewhere else? Is, is there another database on? Uh, the distance the is, is, uh, is measured by the, um, uh, by the people who are collecting the data. So this is not self-reported by the household. This is okay. uh, this is given uh, uh, by the uh, by the yeah by the data collection team. Uh, so now, do they a... actually measure it, or do they get the data from somewhere else? I don't know, um, but uh, yeah, but that's not. Yeah. Uh... But I guess there's uh, right now 
pretty good information about uh, different types of infrastructure, how mm -hmm. it's located geographically, like mm -hmm. external data source, or at least I have used use such data like distance to the main road, distance to, to bank, distance to ATM. Maybe there's also external information on distance to, to the grid. So so what I try to do is, is link this data to uh, Afrobarometer data, right? Because there is a lot of uh, uh, that sort of information in the data, but uh, the, uh, the, the geo coding of this data makes it impossible to, to match it, at least, you know, uh, easily. Maybe there is a, a, some a more sophisticated way to, to do it. I, I have not discovered it yet, but I, but yeah, but that's a good point. If, if we could get some external uh, data on, uh, on um, uh, measures of infrastructure, that would be um, a good addition to the model. And that's something that we had in the in the paper when we were the, the sort of the first paper in, in which we used this approach to estimate demand uh, and that paper used the afrobarometer data we had a whole bunch of indicators of the um you know, of the quality of the, of the infrastructure in the, in the enumeration area and and that did improve the 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 model significantly but here we, we unfortunately don't have it um but uh, that's a good point i would see if we can yeah figure out how to how to merge this uh, this data or maybe get it from somewhere else yeah that's a good point thanks all right so um you know this model has some limitations of course but uh, this is the best that we can do right now so we're going to use it to um uh, to well, first let's see if the model really fits the data well. And from the top panel of this of this table, it seems like it does, right? So uh, the model predicts seventy nine percent of households under the grid to be connected to the grid, and uh, in the data we see seventy seven percent of households connected. So uh, that uh, seems to be quite uh, good. Uh, so then we're going to use that uh, the estimates from the model to predict uptake in off grid households. And here we see that the model predicts that 43% uh, of households in the off-grid areas uh, uh, would be connected to the grid had the green been extended there, right? Now, this, if you if you recall the table of summary statistics where we showed that the households in the under the grid areas are on average better of economically, right? That is not a surprising difference. So we would expect that the lower share of the currently off grid areas would connect to the grid had the grid been extended there, right? But if we, what is really surprising here that when we look at the answers these people gave to the question, on whether you're willing to connect, right? And the question was, uh, you know, are you ready to connect to the grid if the electricity is extended to your area? 93% of those people say that, yes, they're ready to connect. But then when we ask them, uh, are you willing to pay 188,000 um, francs to be connected to, uh, to, to that grid, only 11% of those people uh, now say that they are willing to connect. Okay, so uh, why, why do I think this distinction is interesting? I think that's because it tells us something about how the data on a willingness to connect should be elicited from, from survey data. Uh, we shouldn't ask people, you know, would you like to connect to electricity? We should make it more, uh, more specific and actually tell them what that implies uh, for, their, for their expenses. And you can see that the difference uh, is gigantic, right? 93% says that they're ready to connect, but only 11% are saying they're willing to pay what it would cost to, to connect if the, if the grid was extended. And now we also know from the literature that uh, even when I we have offer- a question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what, 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 what amount of dollars corresponds to this 188,000 and how did you come up with this number? Oh, that I did not come up with that number. Uh, that uh, the the people who designed the survey came up with that number. But this is uh, apparently the amount that uh, it costs on average to 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 get connected uh, to the grid. So that includes you know all the materials, installation, etc. Um, uh, how much this is in in dollars? Um, now you're really testing my uh, my algebra skills. I'd say about three hundred dollars, something like that. So it's a significant oh. expense. Is it? I, I know this is maybe a technical question, but uh, I wonder how much money it costs to connect, for instance, in Europe. And, yeah, uh, no idea. Uh, oh, but I think it's ineligible, right? They just put a meter in your house, and that's it. <laughs> right? There's no, there's really very little infrastructure needed because, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. If it's three hundred dollars, it sounds to me like quite lots of money. And yeah, yeah. I, I know it's it's not for you who designed the survey, but I wonder whether it's like more reasonable to ask different volumes like how, how much are we willing to 
Right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, d definitely. But I think that that wasn't the prime um, idea here. Uh, so the, the number they chose is an actual number that it costs to connect uh, uh, a household. Um, now the question is whether, you know, can we design a subsidy scheme that will help households connect, right? And, and there is a... a there is literature on that, and it, pretty much the 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 result from this literature is that uh, unless you pretty much make it free, the households are very unlikely to connect. Uh, and now that the, obviously the question is why. So one problem is that you know electricity doesn't give you anything if you cannot afford appliances. Uh, that just an expense that uh, um, that uh, is is pretty large on the on the household budget. But unless you can you know buy appliances that uh, that can improve your quality of life or even uh, generate some sort of business uh, uh, or productive use, uh, then that that connection is not going to give you much. So households don't connect. And the second problem is the quality of the connection, right? If uh, if you have blackouts uh, uh, every so often, I mean, you you guys I guess experience pretty frequent black. Out, right, my my aunt tells me, you know, yesterday or two days ago we talked and said, like, oh, we had no electricity uh, until six p.m. You know, that's uh, so. So if 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 you invest in appliances, let's say you buy a fridge and then every other day you don't have electricity for ten hours, that that fridge doesn't uh, doesn't really give you anything, right? Again, it becomes a huge expense that uh, that uh, that goes to waste almost. So. Um, so, so there is there is literature that shows that uh, uh, with electricity service as this, um, you would really a have to uh, let households connect for free to to connect. But even then, uh, the the uptake is not a hundred percent. Now, the the reason why that those are more speculations than than you know actually tested hypotheses, but uh, they seem reasonable. So I wonder on another issue how. So there may be also like a robbery. I don't know whether this. Uh, I mean, guess in South Africa it happens uh, that uh, things are stolen. So uh, and the, the companies com complain about this. Telecoms companies, electricity companies that uh, people steal greed and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Why in this case, if people pay this three hundred dollars, if it's stolen, they have to pay for it again. Maybe that's the reason why they also don't want. Yeah. To no co corruption and and you know uh, transaction costs and. Uh, uh, things like this uh, i mean bribes that people have to pay to get connected uh, all these th things play a, a big role and there's another issue which is the accuracy of billing right so not all of uh, uh, these companies install meters uh, sometimes the the um, the bill is determined based on the size of the household or the dwelling and you know number of people and then you know those numbers can be wildly uh, different and uh, um, and that also plays a pretty a big role in in people's willingness to uh, to connect. Um, so yeah, all those things are, are important. We in in Burkina Faso, most of these households have meters, if I recall correctly. So we did not uh, include that in the analysis because uh, yeah, it, I think over ninety percent of them had meters, so it, it should not be a problem. But I know, for instance, in Nigeria, it was a it was a huge issue. I mean, people were, were getting bills that, that there was no way to determine where they're coming from. And uh, obviously that becomes a deterrent in, in, in connection. Okay. Um, all right. So, so um, the next thing that I, I wanted to show you is sort of uh, um, going back to this point uh, of, uh, uh, of looking at this desire to connect versus, you know, more concrete willingness to pay a specific uh, amount to connect. And how does this compare to the to the model predictions? So here on this graph we have the um, the destiny the the density of the of the um, uh, of the of the predictions from the from our model uh, against the uh, or the predicted probability to connect against the uh, the, the density of these of uh, of the desire to connect. Uh, um, um, split by the households who want to connect and households who do not want to connect. Okay, so on the left panel, we can see that these lines are pretty much the same, which means that there's absolutely no difference in the uh, in the predictions of the model. 
uh, which is the, right, the, pro, the predictive probability to connect among the households that say that they are, uh, you know, they want to connect and the households that say that they don't want to connect, which uh, pretty much means that uh, uh, asking households whether they, they want to connect uh, is completely pointless. It's not gonna, uh, it's not gonna give us a, a good measure of what the uptake would be in a particular uh, community. And then on the right hand side, uh, we do the same as, uh, exercise, but now, um, uh, we split the uh, the households by the willingness to pay for connection, right? So the blue line are the households who are willing to pay this uh, 188,000 uh, francs, and the red line are the households are not. And and here uh, we can see that, uh, uh, that that picture becomes much more realistic, right? So if we uh, ask people about the uh, they stated willingness to pay for connection. Uh, then we are much more likely to to arrive at an answer that's in line with the with our model predictions. Okay, now of course it could be the case that the model predictions are completely wrong. Uh, that's uh, obviously if we believe the model, but um, it does not seem unreasonable. So um, uh, so I think that uh, that it, that the conclusion uh, remains even if uh, if, uh, um, if if our estimates are biased to to some extent. Okay. So, uh, so, so, sort of the main uh, takeaway from this part of the uh, of, of the work is that um, first of all, these off-grid uh, households or households in off-grid areas appear overly optimistic about the desire to connect and the willingness to pay uh, also monthly, as as we'll see later, and that could be that you know the, that this quality of service is an important determinant of uptake, and actually. Um, I can show you. So here is the table that that summarizes the um, the, the stated preferences concerning desire to connect, willingness to pay uh, the specific amount for connection, the maximum uh, willingness to pay for connection, um, and uh, and the monthly uh, willingness to pay for for access to grid electricity. And uh, here we're comparing the uh, off-grid households with under the grid households that are not connected, of course. And you can see that you know along all those dimensions, these off-grid households. Uh, are willing to pay more and are more willing to do uh, to connect, okay? And and those differences are pretty pretty large. And then the the last the four columns show the same distinction, but by by gender, and that's to, that's to um, to show that uh, we also see this gigantic gender heterogeneity uh, in terms of uh, uh, willingness to connect and and willingness to pay uh, for uh, for connection and then. Uh, um, monthly for electricity. Okay, so uh, so uh, it, it really does seem to be the case that uh, that these off-grid households uh, do not have the full information uh, to to make a pretty much informed decision when they ask whether uh, they uh, they willing to connect and how much they're willing to pay. And the missing piece could be that uh, they do not. Uh, see the problems of electricity reliability and the quality of service, for instance. Now that's just a conjecture. Of course, uh, we don't know what the what the real reason is, but it could be that um, that that plays a role, right? And then uh, uh, what what is even more surprising is that when we compare these households that are on and off grid, uh, we see that these uh, uh, under the grid households are actually slightly better off than the off-grid households, right? So that, that goes uh, sort of in the opposite direction than the uh, overly optimistic off-grid off -grid households, because it could be the case that these households are just so much better off uh, than, uh, if, than the under the grid households that are currently not connected, that if the grid is extended there, they really, they really will have a very high uptake, right? But that's not what the data suggests. The data suggests that, the, that an average off-grid household still seems to be um, slightly worse off as compared to an average under the grid unconnected household. Okay, so uh, so that makes this uh, this uh, even even more uh, even more surprising. All right. So now, uh, again, wh why why do we think this is important? Well, we think that that tells something uh, uh, about uh, you know what kind of information should be elicited uh, when uh, uh, when we try to do these exercises for planning purposes, right? And then we need to ask people more uh, concrete questions about uh, how much they're actually going to pay and are they willing to do that than just asking them, you know, if we bring the grid here, would you want to connect? All right. So. 
Then in order to sort of further corroborate that story, we want to estimate uh, determinants of demand among unconnected households. Um, and we want to see whether this access to, uh, to electricity, so being under the grid, uh, is an important uh, uh, predictor of that uh, uh, of that uh, uh, demand okay so we're gonna uh, we're gonna estimate uh, uh, four different models and uh, uh, they they pretty much very similar they just have different dependent variable and because they have a different dependent variable they uh, some of them are linear models some of them are non-linear models because some of these dependent variables are just dummy variables so first we have a dummy that indicates whether an individual i living in household j is ready to connect to the, the grid and now uh, we're going to switch to individual level data okay so remember that i told you that each in each household we uh, interview two different people so now we're gonna we're gonna take this individual level data and we're going to cluster the standard errors at the household level to account for uh, within household uh, correlation Okay, so, so the first one is going to be a probit on the dummy variable that tells us whether uh, individual I living in, in household J is ready to connect. Then we're going to have a dummy variable that's going to indicate whether an individual I living in household J is willing to pay at least this 188,000 francs for connection. And then we're going to have two continuous uh, models, uh, one with the dependent variable of the log of the maximum amount individual I living in household J is willing to pay to be connected to the network, and also uh, the amount that uh, this individual is willing to pay monthly uh, for having electricity. Okay, and this uh, XIJ is going to include uh, different individual and household level uh, level variables. And I can show you the exact questions that were asked to people. So the first question was, would you be ready to connect to the uh, electrical network? Uh, if yes, would you be prepared to pay at least 188,000 188, uh, francs to connect? What is the maximum amount you would be willing to pay? Uh, to be connected to the network and taking into account your income and the type of service that would be provided to you if you were connected to the network, how much would you be ready to pay every month to have electricity? Okay, so these are the exact uh, uh, exact questions we'll ask to people. So there's this a, is- There's yeah. a question by Jason, or more com maybe comment about okay. illegal connections, uh, how much they are willing to pay. <laughs> but I guess if they are illegal connections, they are not willing to pay and I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, um, I don't know how, how big it is. Also, I don't know to be to be uh, to be fair. Um, I uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, from what I try to to get from my co-authors, illegal connections are, does, do not seem to be a big problem. But I have a hard time believing that. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, I, I don't know how much of a problem that is. And uh, uh, whether these people would be willing to uh, to connect uh, if the connection fee was, uh, you know, significantly lower. Uh, but I think that's a that that's a good question. Um, I know that uh, in Nigeria, for instance, the problem of illegal collection was huge. Um, uh, here in the data, there are some questions that could help us uh, determine whether people have illegal connections or not, because they they try to ask people whether uh, their connection is used by neighbors or and whether the neighbors pay them, or contribute to monthly expenses. But uh, there is a high chance that people will not answer those questions truthfully, because they're afraid that uh, that might be used by the utility company to actually you know, found, uh, find those illegal connections. So we decided not to not to use that information. Um, uh, and I mean, from that, the percentage seems to be extremely low, so. In relation to this, I mean, I, I only have one comment. Uh, so actually like I talked about a colleague of mine from here from South Africa about the problem of someone not paying for rent. And I think the easiest is if indeed, if you have the, the meter, so <laughs> one, uh, uh, no, actually, it wasn't concerning here. It was concerning UK. In fact. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, but uh, in South Africa, there's uh, metered uh, usage, and mm -hmm. there's like a prepaid or something, yeah. uh, post postpaid. Yeah. I wonder how it is over there. And uh, both uh, about yeah. half of these households had prepaid, and half of these households had uh, postpaid meters. And maybe one one of this type is easier to exclude people from uh, connecting to the grid. Illegally, I don't know whether this is a uh, potential or like. A, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, good. Yeah, I'll check. I did not think about that. So, whether prepaid or postpaid meters have any. Yeah, it's a good idea. 
Okay, now I know what I meant. So a colleague of mine has a problem of getting rid of the tenant who doesn't pay. Mm -hmm. And if he had met metered electricity, then just the meter runs out, and uh, but uh, he has to actually pay the electricity for this guy. So um, maybe similar in case of illegal connections or yeah. stuff like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that that's a very good point. Um, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll look into it. I have no idea, to be, to be honest, how the situation looks over there. Um, but that's, yeah, that's very strange. That's how it works in the UK. That, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that, that problem can arise. Um, anyway, so, um, uh, so let's see what we get uh, from, uh, from these models. Oh, so one more thing. So here we're gonna uh, we're gonna uh, estimate two types of models. So we're gonna estimate uh, the the cross-sectional models, and we're gonna do an IV probit and again, cluster the standard errors at the household level. And we're also going to do an IV random effects model with Mandler cor uh, correction. And uh, here we're going to exploit this panel structure of the data. OK, so we're estimating a random effects model because uh, we can't really estimate fixed effects models easily with, uh, with binary choice models. Uh, so and so that's why we use this Mundlach correction to uh, sort of model the the uh, household level fixed effects, uh, and we use the averages of the household level characteristics uh, as uh, as proxy for this uh, for this fixed effects at the household level. Right. So the assumption here is that these unobserved fixed effects are correlated with the observed uh, characteristics. So we use the averages of the observed characteristics to proxy for. Um, uh, for the for the fixed effect, the unobserved fixed effect uh, uh, characteristics. All right. So, and the reason why we're using IV is because uh, remember that the key of this analysis is to determine whether access uh, matters uh, for for this demand uh, um, attributes, and uh, we think that this uh, this access, of course, is endogenous to. Uh, uh, to um, to our dependent variables, so we're going to use again this uh, this mean distance electricity poison instrument for access uh, uh, in this in this part. Now, uh, we, to, to be co completely transparent, we use this instrument because we can't find a better one. Uh, it works. I mean, all the tests checks out, but. Uh, but I would like to be able to, to get something here that would give us a better story to support the, the usage of, of instrument. But we haven't been able to, to do it uh, um, yet. But again, sort of from a technical point of view, the story checks out and, uh, and this, this strategy seems to work. Um, so this is what we get. Uh, so on the top, uh, I only uh, uh, put here the um, the coefficients on the variable female and access to the grid because these are the two things of interest. Remember, first of all, we want to know whether access matters for these demand uh, decisions, and second of all, we wanted to see whether we can confirm this uh, this gender heterogeneity that's present in the literature that's been estimated uh, in in relation to to these demand uh, um, decisions. Right. So uh, in the top panel we have the results from the cross-section analysis. In the bottom panel, we have the results from the panel analysis. The, the results are more or less uh, similar. Uh, so we can't really compare all these magnitudes because uh, uh, these are just coefficients. And in some cases, they don't really tell us much. But uh, if we just focus on the signs, uh, we we can, uh, with pretty high level of certainty, say that we can um, confirm the presence of huge gender heterogeneity in respect to uh, to these demand decisions. So men are much more willing to connect to the grid and they are willing to pay much more for grid electricity. And uh, now I have not found uh, any sort of, you know, scientific explanation for that gender heterogeneity. Pretty much every paper that does it finds that gender heterogeneity, but uh, no paper so far has proposed a good explanation for that. Um, it could be that, you know, if females are in charge of uh, budgets at the household level, they're more aware of where the money needs to be taken out from in order to pay for this electricity. And maybe that means less money for education. Maybe that means less money for, uh, for health uh, expenditures. So they are much more aware of uh, of those trade-offs, and therefore they're much uh, um, less likely to declare willingness to uh, to connect, and then um, they are willing to pay less for uh, for electricity, or m maybe in other words, the maximum amount that they're willing to pay for connection and then monthly is lower than it is among men. Um, and sort of the, the good news for us uh, from here is that the panel. Uh, a panel analysis pretty much gives us the same results as the cross-section analysis, which uh, 
um, pretty much uh, means that you know the, the robustness checks from the from the panel like analysis uh, confirms the the results from the from the IV estimation. Okay, so and then also for the access to the grid, we also see, with exception to the first model, that uh, that uh, households located in areas uh, with access to the grid, so the under the grid households have a much lower willingness to uh, to pay uh, for uh, for connection and for um, uh, monthly for electricity than households in in off grid areas. Okay, the the results for the uh, desire to connect is insignificant. Uh, um both in the in the uh, cross-section and pan analysis so uh, we do not see that for that model but the other three uh models show us that it's indeed the case that that uh, the households that are under the grid have a much uh, lower willingness to pay okay so i see it's quarter to three and i already have yeah quite a few slides left so i'm trying to hurry up so um, I think I think this this start because we are asking questions in the meantime. Yeah, so no, that's okay. Right that's that's yeah. perfectly fine. Yeah, I'm just thinking that the ten or fifteen minutes left might still not be enough. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, that's I I, I really uh, enjoy questions in the middle of the talk rather than at the end. So that's that's great. All right. So so this is sort of concludes the the this this part when we try to estimate demand, determinants of demand, and uh, and try to say something about. Uh, um, uh, whether access to the grid uh, is a, is an important uh, determinant of uh, of uh, of these uptake decisions. The next thing we're going to switch to is uh, uh, estimation of willingness to pay for now reliable electricity. Okay, so this part is going to look at connected households, uh, of course, in under the grid areas, and uh, uh, among these households, we try to 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 get information on the willingness to pay for reliable electricity. Okay, and and that information was elicited using an iterative bid approach, so contingent valuation method. So here respondents are presented with a hypothetical scenario and they ask if they are willing to pay a specified amount for that particular scenario. Okay, and then there are possible follow-up questions. And this method is applied extensively to the valuation of non-market goods, such as environment, for instance, and also for a variety of public programs in, in developing countries, right? So when we try to figure out how much people are willing to pay for something, that is one of the main methods that is being used. The other method would be the a choice experiment, but uh, this is uh, um, much less common. And uh, my understanding is that choice experiments uh, work well in, in settings that are very uh, well known to respondents. So in this case, choice experiment would be nice. But uh, if we would want to ask people in off-grid areas about electricity uh, and the willingness to pay for it, then choice experiments are not really um, recommended because uh, then uh, this is something that the respondents are not very familiar with. So um, uh, this this contingent valuation method uh, supposedly works well in in both cases. Um, so th th this this method has been used again extensively also, also with respect to energy sector and like, there are some papers that uh, that that rely on this method to estimate a willingness to pay for reliable electricity in developing countries right so the, the reliable is important because again this is this is um, um, elicited from actually connected households right and the question is how much are you willing to pay for better service pretty much for a service that gives you uninterrupted and electricity service um, and then uh, in developed countries, this method is, is often used to, uh, to estimate willingness to pay for renewable electricity. And there is a uh, lot of papers that, that employ this approach. All right, so, uh, so in our survey, uh, respondents were asked to indicate their willingness to pay for high quality electricity service without power cuts or voltage drops. And uh, they were reminded about the current expenses on electricity, and they were also told that the answer could be used to design policy for the future as a reminder to attempt to answer truthfully. But of course, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, that we completely eliminated uh, uh, potential for certain biases, such as protest bids, right? So people just not stating they they truthful willingness to pay for some reason or some sort of strategic misreporting so that they would state something that is, again, not a, a, a truthfully um, willingness to pay uh, for some strategic reasons. Um, so uh, what? how did we do it exactly? So respondents were first asked whether they would accept to pay one of five randomly drawn prices. 
Uh, and then in each round, the respondents were given the equivalent monthly bill based on the current electricity usage and the randomly selected hypothetical price. Okay, so they, they, were, they were given price per kilowatt per hour, but they were also said, okay, based on your current consumption, this is how much you'll be paying at this price. Uh, and then if the respondent answered yes to the first question, then the amount associated with that subsequent questions would increase by uh, by 15%. So it would be 115% of the original amount. If the person answered no to the first question, then in the second round, they would get a, a lower bid, a bid that was 85% of the, of the previous value. And that continued to a maximum of three possible values offered. If the respondents answered three times yes or three times no, then uh, the respondents were asked an open-ended question about the maximum uh, uh, value of the, of the of the maximum willingness to pay. Okay. Um, so then, when we uh, when we estimate the, this this model using an interval regression, or that's really an ordered probit with known thresholds, um, we get a, a distribution for the uh, for the willingness to pay, uh, and uh, we contrast this here on the graph with the declared uh, willingness to pay for the monthly bill. Uh, for the households that are under the grid and the households that are off-grid. So the off-grid households are the red uh, rectangulars or bars, and the uh, under the grid households are the blue bars, and the, uh, the straight uh, line is the, is the estimated willingness to pay um, from our interval regression. And uh, what becomes really uh, striking from this picture is that, that the uh, there is a striking difference between the estimated willingness to pay for reliable service among connected, connected households relative to stated willingness to pay for access to electricity among unconnected households. And what we, we can quantify it and we can see that on average, uh, um, connected households are willing to pay about $15 a month for access to high quality service, while uh, an average resident in a household that's not co connected to electricity is willing to pay $11 for monthly uh, $11 monthly for access to the grid. Okay, so there is obviously a difference here because we, for, for the connected households, we're looking at the access to reliable electricity, right? And for that, they're willing to pay about $15 a month. Whereas the the uh, the other amount, so the $11 a month, that's uh, that's just uh, the the amount of money that households are willing to pay for access. Okay, there's no uh, there was no mention of how good that access is going to be. But taken at face value, what this is telling us that these currently connected households are willing to pay more monthly for better service than, uh, than the unconnected households are willing to pay for connection to the grid. So it might make more sense to first improve the service and uh, increase the prices among connected households and then uh, think about extension of the grid instead of extending the grid, decreasing everybody's service the quality of everybody's service um, and uh, and then having to uh, to deal with low uptake because we already know that good quality of service is a significant determinant of of uptake all right all right uh, oh so I did it in time great so the highlights of the paper uh, again that we we see that and I think we provide a pretty convincing evidence that off-grid households are overly optimistic about grid connection and you know about whether they're willing to connect and how much they're willing to to pay for that uh, we 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 can uh, sort of conjecture from our results that elicitation methods should focus on willingness to pay rather than willingness to connect and uh, we also confirm the presence of large gender heterogeneity, right? So again, men have higher willingness to pay for high quality service and also a state a higher desire to connect and are willing to pay more for both connection and monthly payments. And uh, again, we, we see that improving infrastructure might yield a higher revenue than, than extending the grid, uh, because we know that quality of service is an important predictor of uptake. And we see that, uh, that disconnected households are willing to pay more for a better quality of electricity than unconnected households are willing to pay just for access to the grid. And with that, I think uh, I can uh, finish. Thank you very much for the presentation, Agnieszka. Um, I think we asked already some questions, but anybody would like to ask any further questions? Okay. Actually, I have a following question. So um, the objective here is to estimate the willingness to pay for electricity uh, one, as one of the object objectives. I wonder whether it's not possible to 
estimated not not by asking the question about how much people are willing to pay but just by from the stated information about uh, whether people have electricity or not and uh, then combining this with information about uh, the tariffs or whatever this would be i mean this would be like a standard approach let's say to estimate electricity electric uh, elasticity of demand for different products uh, telecommunications whatever else just mm -hmm. run a survey ask people what do you have uh, do you have this service that service i don't know which type do you have and then um, uh, combine this with tariff information and on this basis you will have people who, who don't have the service who have the service and you should be able to also identify uh, the price coefficient for elasticity of demand and willingness to pay so just from the observations but so uh, so here uh, the uh, the information we need is, is consumption right how much electricity people are using or can we do it with just uh, um, uh, because it's just, just with information about whether people are connected or not uh, but of course one needs a variation there will be some people connected some people not connected mm -hmm. but there's need there's needed variation maybe in how much people pay for it i don't know whether there's like one one type of tariff everywhere yeah i'm not country, sure then, yeah uh, that's a good question i'm not sure if we have information about how much people pay for connection from I, the from the connected households i, I know we know uh, we know how much they're paying currently for electricity so we know what is the what is the current uh, tariff but i don't know if they if, if we know about how much they paid for the connection i uh, i can check that of course i'll look into it it's a good idea Right, so I'm, I'm saying this also because I mean, I, I myself estimated willingness to pay, let's say, for telecommunication services. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were not doing this by asking people about how much you are willing to pay, we just estimated from the data, but from observations of who has the service, who doesn't have. And uh, we need, of course, information about how much they pay for it. And, right. Uh, yeah. yeah. But so one problem I, I can foresee with this is that uh, if we are interested in knowing, uh, um, willingness to pay for high quality service, right? I, I don't know if there's enough people in the data who actually have high quality service. Right, I mean, that's another thing that, so so it's also possible to identify how the high quality service in a way impacts utility yeah. Yeah. Uh, and for how much they're willing to pay for it, but uh, you need to have variation in, uh, yeah. in, in this. So if there's just poor quality service and you want to, uh, measure willingness to pay for high quality service, you cannot do it. Yes. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. But yeah, related no. to this, so because uh, I think like this kind of surveys are also very common in, uh, I mean, asking people about, as you as you were saying, uh, so the, the choice experiments or something like this, mm -hmm. especially products which don't exist, yeah. then, you, then, then you cannot estimate uh, willingness to pay. You propose pe to people something that doesn't exist and you try to find out how much they're willing to pay. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's always uh, a, a bias in, in terms of uh, what people say and, and what people are really doing. Yeah. And I wonder, I mean, in general, I think it goes in the in one direction. So people always are over optimistic about that they would buy this product. But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there is. Yeah, there, there is literature on that, right? That that sort of the difference between the state and the revealed preferences. So this is not. Uh, uh, this is not. Uh, um, very surprising uh, that that we also see it here in the data. What I thought was surprising is the extent of it. That uh, it seems to be, um, yeah, really um, surprising uh, how and uh, and pretty much unreli unreliable these 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 answers the questions. Now, would you like to connect? Are right. Uh, and I, I think that you know this is all. It's also not the case that anybody is actually asking people that and making decision based on that. Just the question, you know, are you willing to connect? And then you know, if ninety percent of the particular area says yes, willing to connect, the grid gets extended. Right? That doesn't work this way. But uh, I think it, it, sort of the point that we were trying to make at least is that uh, you know we have to be very careful about what we ask people in order to get information that will give us. Uh, um, yeah, solid information on which we can base those those planning decisions. However, I mean, it may not be the case in uh, in Burkina Faso or elsewhere, but uh, I know that, for instance, in, say, in Europe, like at least for, in Poland, I spoke recently to a colleague who got fiber connections, so telecommunications broadband, mm 
-hmm. And I was surprised because he lives in a small village. So I was thinking like, oh, how come they, they develop the network here? Mm -hmm. And he said that, I mean, there's of course like state aid that goes into this. Yeah. But sec second, the company uh, uh, launched a website asking people to report how many of them would like to get connection. And uh, people were, of course, self-reporting. So there, there was a number of people who declared that they will get the connection. Mm -hmm. uh, whether they will or not uh, is another question. But I think everybody knows that if you get internet, that increases the value of your house pretty much. Yeah. So yeah no, that's, a, that's a very good point but do you know if it was the case that they, they already had some service and they were just replacing with another service no it was totally a new just... service so it okay. was lay, laying out infrastructure mm -hmm. and uh, the company to test them the, the size of the market whether it's mm -hmm. profitable uh, i guess run this kind of survey i went to people asked them but he sent someone even to home and asked are you going to get a connection mm -hmm. and then probably they counted number of people and said okay it's profitable so it's i guess it's yeah, I mean, yeah, I that, that's it's... that's interesting. But it may work different in uh, for yeah. various reasons in African countries than in um, like developed economy because then people really maybe will pay this. Yeah, and uh, you stated the reason why people may not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a no, question but... uh, by Lawrence. By the way, he asked how much can how can we improve household willingness to pay for electricity? Um, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think that well, I, th I think to well. Two things have to happen. One is the quality has to improve. Uh, I mean, it really has to be the case that uh, that electricity can be used, you know, in a uh, in a continuous manner, and uh, um, people can take advantage of the uh, of the appliances that uh, that they rely on. Uh, second is that people have to be able to turn that electricity into productive use. Um, otherwise, uh, especially with low quality of, of service we might run into situations when where people get themselves into uh, into monthly payments uh, that they cannot afford and that they're paying for something that doesn't doesn't generate any income and that uh, um, of course is not a, a desirable outcome right because instead of helping uh, uh, those really mo most impoverished people will be hurting them by 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 bringing the grid there. Um, and the third thing actually is probably, you know, the appliances have to be available to people. So there has to be some sort of uh, a loan scheme that allows people to, uh, to purchase appliances that they can then use together with reliable service into, uh, into a productive use. So for instance, when we're in Nigeria, we talk to, uh, to people living in some village that didn't have uh, that didn't have access to the grid, and they kept telling us that you know they petitioned to the local government, they they asked for the uh, for the for the grid to be extended, that they have all the money that they are willing to pay, but they just not uh, not bringing it to them, and and uh, you know they were really really sort of very clear about they already knew what they're going to do when they have the electricity and it wasn't watching tv and and you know listening to the radio they wanted to uh, to improve the the agricultural outcome they wanted to uh, to get uh, fridges for instance to sell uh, drinks on the market they wanted to get small tools to uh, to work right to 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 generate uh, uh, to generate some sort of business out of that that electricity so i think that as long as people can do that uh, in a in a continuous way, then then the uptake of, of electricity will increase. Uh, but if the if the service provided is of low quality, there is a, uh, there is low um, there there is frequent blackouts and uh, a problem with with voltage. Right. So for instance, we're I remember we're sitting in a in a village chief's uh, hut and there was a lamp in the hut and a fan. And uh, we were there for maybe 20 minutes, and within these 20 minutes, the the brightness of the of the lamp changed uh, pretty frequently, and the fan kept uh, starting and stopping. And that uh, wasn't because somebody was uh, uh, operating; it was because the electricity uh, that was being fed into the grid just wasn't enough to uh, to power that 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 fan. Right. So um, yeah. So I think quality appliances and productive use those are three things that that we should. Um, a focus on in order to, to increase uptake. And as your paper suggests, uh, electricity companies should talk to men, not to women. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not so sure because what might happen is that if they talk to men, then uh, uh, they will have a much lower uptake than they expected. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I think this is 
uh, th this is a result that that requires more um, looking into. I think it it goes you know beyond just a uh, uh, yeah. It, it's it's not random. There must be something about uh, maybe risk aversion. Maybe you know. Um, uh, again, managing household budget that determined the decision, but uh, it's very consistent. Pretty much every paper I, I saw on the topic finds that gender heterogeneity. See, there's another question, I think. Um, I think this no? were all the questions no, okay. that, that was already asked. So I think it's already seven minutes past, past three. We can finish for today. Thank you very much again. Uh, yeah, thank you. For your willingness to present. Uh, it's very interesting research and relevant for South Africa as well. Mm. So yeah. hope to see more research of this type. And also you already have connection to South Africa. If you mm -hmm. plan to visit again, uh, please let me know. Uh, we'll be happy to host you here. Yeah, I will. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, everyone. Uh, see you next time. Okay.